For some weeks we've been on this series we're calling Graces and Places. If you've been with us, then uh, you know we've already covered a lot of ground. If you haven't, uh, we'll review a little bit, but couldn't possibly cover everything and, and advance further in the same amount of time. So go back to the Word Supply and take advantage of the materials. Download it for no charge off the internet site. But our text has been 1 Corinthians 12. And uh, verse 13, well, let me see, verse 12. He says, As the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free. How many bodies are there? One. Just one. And have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not the body, is it therefore not of the body? What's the answer? No, no it's still of the body. If the ear would say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Now, do you hear this tone? Have you ever heard this kind of talk out of people? Well, if I can't be this, I'm not going to be a part. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? You know, maybe it came out of your mouth. I don't know. <laughs> but, but if I can't be that, maybe it was a school play in the sixth grade. You know, if I can't be the lead, then I'm not going to be a part. If I can't be the quarterback, then I'm not going to play. If I can't do this, then I'm not. Well, everybody can't be the quarterback. Hmm? Not everybody's graced to be the quarterback. And if somebody's not graced to be a defensive line, a quarterback ain't going to be quarterback very long. How many understand in athletics? You might like to play basketball, but there's some people is a better player without trying than others would ever be practicing every day of their life. Huh? Why? Because they, they have the body. They have the, the skill. They have the ability. It just comes easy for them. And some people, you know, they just, especially in pro sports, I mean, unless you're a certain height and unless you're a certain size, it's going to be just very difficult to contend with the other guys that are that height and that are that size. Right? So what I'm saying is they're graced to be able to do that, where others with intense effort can't even get close to that level of skill. Now he said, if, if they say, well, because I'm not the eye, I'm, I'm not part of the body. Is that true? That's not true. If the whole body were an eye, where was the hearing? The whole body is one big eye. <laughs> or just many, many eyes. <laughs> Where's the hearing going to be? Help me out. There would be no hearing. And if, if the whole was a hearing, where's the smelling? You wouldn't have any. Verse 18 is our text. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Read that out loud with me. But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. When you believe on Jesus, the Holy Spirit baptizes you, immerses, places you into the body of Christ, you are born a specific body part. Yes. Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. And like we've said before, you know, parents mean well and they tell their children, honey, you're, you're smart, you're beautiful, you're intelligent, you're this, you're that. You can be anything you want to be. That's not true. 
If you're an eye, you'll never be a decent ear. Right? <laughs> huh? If you're a man, you'll never be a decent woman. <laughs> I know that. So I'm not even going to try. I'm going to rejoice in God's choice for me. I don't believe you made mistakes with it. Did you hear me? If I, if I were to feel differently about it, there's something wrong with the way I feel. Not something wrong with him. We're not to look to our feelings or to our desires to define us and tell us who and what we are. Believers are to look to the Word to tell you what you are. Right? And if your feelings are contrary, they must submit to what He said and what He's given us. So God has given us all a specific place in His body, the body of Christ, the church. And all of us have received grace or graces that enable us to be the body part we're created to be. Do you believe that? Amen. So it's not really true to tell your young ones you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. No, that's, if, if you're going to be a Christian, you're going to be a believer, that's already been decided for you. Yeah. So it's not up, up to us to decide what we want to be. It's for us to discover yeah. what we're already ordained yeah. to be. Amen. Do you believe that? Yeah. And we saw that unto every, God has placed every one of us. Did it say every one? Every. Are you back with me there in the text? God has set the members, which one? How many of us? Every, every one of them in the body, not as it pleased you or your mama or your grandpa, as it pleased who? Him. So you need to have confidence in his choice and faith in what He has predetermined. And we saw also, we took time and went through it, and saw that every one of us has been given grace, our gifts to fill our place. Let me read these to you. Don't try to turn to them. Just listen. 1 Corinthians 7, 7 says, Every man has his proper gift of God. Ephesians 4, 7 says, Unto every one of us is given grace. Romans 12, 3, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. 1 Peter 4, 10, as every man has received the gift. How many of us have received a gift or grace? Every one of us. If you say, well, I don't have anything, you're wrong. You just haven't discovered it or developed in it, Right? But if you are born again, if you are a child of God, there's a place you fit. Yes. Oh, come on now. And in that place, you are graced and gifted to be that part in that body. How many think there ought to be a big priority for every believer to find that place and to do that job? Because nowhere else are you going to fit. And nowhere, nothing else are you going to be as skilled and able in. So we're talking about graces and places. Somebody said out loud, I, I, have I, have I have a place and I have grace. Thanks be unto God. Now we, we went on talking about how to find and fill your place. We're into that now. And we said you can help identify your place by desires. We found that even God works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. We saw that where we were born and, and who we've been around is not an accident. Right? The fact that we're born and live now instead of a hundred years ago is not an accident. Associations that God has allowed us environment, where we've been and who we've been around, all of it was working on us to mold us and sculpt us before we're even aware of it to be what we're ordained to be and do what we're ordained to do. And then also we touched on this. Uh, 
uh, ease, I'll say it like this, ease and expertise. What do you mean? Well, like we're referring to a, a little bit ago, you can help identify what you are by your graces. And uh, what comes easy to you and is difficult for other people is not because you're just so amazing, it's because you're graced. Are you with me? I, I touched on it before, you know. I, my call is to speak. That's part of my, you know, why I exist. I didn't always know that, but looking back now, I can see it. It's, you know, other people are mortified and terrified to get up in front of somebody and speak. I've never been that way. <laughs> never been that way. I mean, uh, I would, it, you know, the, the literature teacher or it came to poetry or, or this or that. I mean, they, they'd call on me. It used to be a joke. I would read with different accents in the fifth grade. <laughs> Teacher didn't know what to do with me because I, I was reading it right. I was just reading it with an accent. One day it's English, one day it's Spanish. Well, I mean, you know. Well, I mean, you can't be too scared if you're doing that kind of stuff, you know. We went to a regional thing with one of the school things, and, uh, and they were having this election for the state, and they, they didn't realize it, and nobody was represented from our area. I said, no problem, I'll run. I got up and gave a speech and they all voted for me and I, and I won. <laughs> That's not because I'm so smart or this or that. It's because God had a plan for me to speak. Now, do you understand? I could have prostituted it. I could have used it for something else. And you see this with people all through life, don't you? They have amazing abilities and they're using it to gain fame for themselves or just to gain money or notoriety. And it's something they were born with. They think, well, I just, I'm just skilled. I'm just talented. No, you're graced to do a job in the body of Christ. So you can help identify where you fit and what your call is by what you find easy to do. Yeah, I mean, you can do it almost without practicing. I mean, and it just comes natural and easy to you. Expertise and ease. Don't attribute it to yourself. Realize you've been graced. And why have you been graced? Help me out. Why have you been graced? There's a place where you fit. There's a job you can do that will help others and help build the kingdom and help do the will and plan of God. Do you want to know that place? Do you want to operate it? Do you want to function in your graces and develop in them? Now we came down to this. Go to Acts, please, the 13th chapter. Acts, the 13th chapter. And notice in verse 2, it says they were in the church, verse 1, certain prophets and teachers, and they waited on the Lord. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed to Seleucia and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now this is not just something they decided to do and it's not just something these men decided to send them to do. The Holy Ghost sent them. How many know that makes all the difference? Like one fellow said, uh, some are sent and some just went. And you can see the results or lack thereof, depending on which one it was. But did you hear this language? What did the Spirit of God say? Separate unto me these individuals for the work whereunto I have called them. And so we note these individuals are already in the ministry. 
Barnabas and Saul, now later called Paul. They're already in the ministry, and we see the, from the previous verse, they're already either a prophet or a teacher or both. And yet, they're not in the ministry that he had called them to, that he had been getting them ready for. And now he said, separate unto me these men for what I've called them to do. But what had been coming before, obviously, was preparing them and getting them ready for this. So here's another part. How can you wind up in the place God planned for you to wind up doing what he foreordained for you to do? You must identify it. We would already talked about the things that are involved in this. You must develop in it. Somebody say develop. Develop. You must develop. It's just like any grace that you want. We talked about athletics. How many know these guys that have, you know, amazing physiques and they got the height or they got the size or they got the speed or they got the, the, the flexibility or the dexterity? How many understand that's not enough? Do you know that's not enough to be the best of the best? What else did they have to do? Many of them been practicing every day or every other day for the last 20 years, right? right? They, even though they had the potential, they had to develop in it. And if you're going to develop in it, you have to separate yourself to it. You have to give yourself to it, which means there's a lot of other things you're not going to be able to do. Separate yourself. Say it out loud. Separate yourself. What does separate mean? You're separated from all of this and to this. Now we live in a very distracting world, don't we? And there are many voices in this world and all of them saying something. And how many of the enemy is trying to get you off course? trying to lead you down a wrong path, trying to get you involved in things that will entangle you in the affairs of this life to the point you've got nothing left. No time, no money, no energy for God, for his church, for his things. And friend, this is one of the saddest things that's going on on the planet right now. There are millions of people they're born again, they know the Lord, but they hadn't got time for him for anything. They're up to their eyes, making a living. They're up to their, and what time they have beside that, they spend on their hobbies, on their recreation, and there's nothing left for God. They believe in him, but they give him nothing. It's sad because your life and my life is about that long. Right? Do we have 20 years to waste? No, you don't. We don't know how much longer before he returns. We don't know what we've got. Either way, you know it's not much. Not much for you before we're out of here. Friend, if you're going to develop in what you're called to be, you've got to give yourself to it. Somebody say, give yourself. give yourself. Give yourself. The Lord helped me to see this early on in life as a teenager, that if you're going to be good at something, you got to give yourself to it. You got to pay the price that others are not willing to pay. It's got, you got to give your time and energy and effort more than a lot of people. A lot of people are satisfied just to live what they consider an acceptable life and, and mediocrity is, is fine with them. I was going to be a fighter. I know that sounds funny to some folks, but I was. I was going to be a full contact. They didn't have the ultimate fighting stuff uh, like they do now, but we had full contact martial arts, and that's what I wanted to be. I got, my, I got in it when I was 10, and I had been training all through my teenage years, and I was pursuing it. And I was going to go to Okinawa, and I was going to train with the best, and I was going to take the next steps. I, I believed I could be the full contact champion. And uh, the Lord got a hold of me. 
Thank you, Lord. <laughs> that, you know, I could have pursued that, but I wouldn't have done this. I'm so glad that it helped me Amen. to see. And I knew in order to develop in that, you got to give yourself to it. I mean, you got to train virtually every day. You got to push when you don't want to push. You got to fight when you're hurt and you're injured and everything else. And when the Lord got a hold of me that that wasn't his path and plan for me and that I was to pursue him in ministry, it took him a while to get that across to me. <laughs> I didn't get it overnight. But when he did, I thought, well, Lord, I'm not going to do any less for you. I mean, I was willing to go to the other side of the world and sit at the feet of who I considered to be the master in this and to do whatever it took to train and get better. And so, Lord, I'm asking you, do the same for me in your work. Amen. Wherever it is, whoever it is, and you know within a year, I was sitting at Brother Hagin's feet. <laughs> and I was with him for 20 years. Thank God. And for me, that was the master teacher and trainer for my life. And I am so thankful for the opportunity. But even at that, how many understand we still uh, had to separate ourselves? Phyllis and I had to separate ourselves. We, we left home. We left our jobs. We left our stuff. We left everything. And we went and uh, uh, I realized I knew how to kick and I knew how to punch, but I didn't know scriptures. <coughs> so what's it time for me to do? So man, you know, I, we begin to hit the, hit, hit the book. And uh, I mean, I, we, we're in class all day and I'm three classes and I'm in prayer school then I'm in healing school and then at home I'm studying half the night. And I mean, uh, a friend of mine, we'd get together and we'd go over everything that we heard that day and we'd ask each other the scriptures. Do you remember that? And we learned them and we, we'd be able to quote them and we did this month after month after month after month after month after month after month. After month. After month, after month, I'm telling you. And when school was over, there were some people that were concerned about me. You know, why don't you? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Nobody was asking me to preach. Nobody is offering me any positions. And uh, I said, well, no. Uh, I said, uh, there's no shortage of places to go and people that need to be ministered to. There is a shortage of people that's got something to say when they get there. So I'm going to work on getting something to say. <laughs> So I studied and I prayed and I studied and I prayed and I studied and I prayed and then I studied some more. You need to guess what I did next? Pray. I prayed and then I studied and I prayed. And then the Lord, you know, allowed me to begin to share a little bit. You just talked to some people after the service and, and some things along that line. But I esteemed it and I valued it and, and I began to have more opportunity. And, uh, then I began to have opportunities to speak. And, and, and it got so much so that I, I speak in 20 and 25 times a week. And, and at that point I said, Lord, this seems like too much. And he said, you asked for it. <laughs> Come on, think about it. How are you going to develop at running? Not sitting on the couch. Right? How are you going to develop in swimming? Not on dry land. Right? How are you going to develop in preaching? Not from sitting in the congregation. How are you going to develop? By giving yourself to it. Separating yourself from all the things that would take up all your time. And get people to say, well, I, I got to make a living. Well, we did too. People think, well, you know, well, you just magically all this money appeared and you never had to think. No, it was a decision. Everybody likes a regular paycheck. <laughs> but how many know if it's what the Lord told you to do? And not everybody's supposed to be a preacher. I'm not saying that. But there is something you're supposed to do. And when you find that, how many know you're supposed to separate yourself from everything that would take you away from that and give yourself to that so that you develop? Now, there is a danger in talking about these things. 
Uh, go with me to Romans, the 11th chapter. Put it up on the screen for us. What does it say? He said, I speak to you Gentiles. This is Paul speaking by the Spirit. Insomuch that I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Apostle means sent one. What else did he say after that? I magnify mine office. Everybody say that phrase out loud. I magnify my office. Say it again. I magnify my office. What does magnify mean? Make it big as opposed to what? Little. Should it be a big thing in your eyes? Should you make a big deal out of it? Big deal out of what? Whose office? Now see what people have a tendency to do is make a big deal out of somebody else and despise theirs. That's a big mistake. What did he say? How many believe Paul found his place? How many believe Paul developed fully in the graces that God put in him and the anointings that he put? Did he start out that way? No, he started out persecuting the church, trying to destroy the church. But even though he was so deceived and so messed up, how many understand all those years he spent sitting at the feet of Gamaliel? All those years he had spent in the Word, in the law, God was getting him ready. Even though he was totally confused in his mind, oh, come on, can you see it? His associations, his environment, what came easy for him, what he developed easily in expertise. He was a speaking gift. He was graced to study the Word, wasn't he? And here he is trying to destroy the church. <laughs> but he got saved. I said he got saved. And you remember there were years where he wasn't really in circulation that much. God was helping him to put, out, put the new covenant together with what he had learned about the old. And giving him revelation of the church. So much of what we have came through him, didn't it? These epistles of Romans and Corinthians and Ephesians and Galatians and Philippians, thank God. Right? But then he came to realize that just like Peter and others were sent to preach the gospel to the Jews, he was sent to the uncircumcised. He was sent to the heathen that worshipped rocks and right and everything. Else. He was sent to them. And what's he said? I magnify what I'm called to. I magnify my, should you magnify what you're called to yeah. and your place and your grace? If you don't, it's never going to become what it should. Listen to the, uh, the NIV says, I make much of my ministry. The Amplified says, I lay great stress on my ministry and magnify my office. Office. The word, you know what the word office means in the Greek? It means service. It means service. That's why as the Lord led us in the development of this church, we don't have ministry teams. We have service teams. Because people have gotten confused about ministry. Did you hear me? There are many seeking positions. Did you hear me? And when they think ministry, they think position. But the word literally means service. That's what deacon means. I mean, you got all kinds of churches around and the deacons are running the church and telling the, you know, hiring and firing the pastors and a lot of them are absolutely unspiritual. And yet they're just running the things. And yet, you remember what the first deacons did? Waited tables. 
Right? Yes. It takes religion to turn that in to what's going on now. Right. <laughs> Say it out loud. I am saved, I am saved to, serve. to serve. Say it again. I am saved, I am saved to serve. To serve. When you're born again, you're made a specific part of the body for why? Help me out. Help me out. To serve. To serve. And you are graced with certain spiritual gifts and, and, and divine abilities Amen. that God has put in you. You may not have found them. You may have not have developed in them to any appreciable degree, but they're there. I said they're there. And you can find them and you can develop in them. Tell me why. What are they there for? Why are they there? To serve. Yes, to serve. Where is your service? What, where are you serving? In the body of Christ. That's why we have service teams all over this church. I'm at work in my service right now. Right? This is my service. And when I hear you know, Brother Dave, reading those testimonies about those people that were down and hopeless and they got a hold of the Word and they came out and they're happy and they're healed. Yeah. Glory to God makes me want to shout. Because yeah. the Lord used me and I was of some service yeah. to them. Glory. How many one of the worst, know one of the worst things on the planet is to be useless? I mean, if you go through a day and a week and a month and you're no good to anybody, right. it's wasted life. How many want not, not to be useless, but you want to be useful? Yes. You want to be of service. Yes. You want to be of service to the Lord. You want to be of service to his church. You want to be of service to his people. You want to be of service yes. to your family. How can you be of service? By being what he created you to be and developing in what he put inside you. That, you know, just you after the flesh are not going to be that useful to anybody. I know you didn't want to hear that, but it's just the truth. But what God has called you to be and what he has put in you, that is truly valuable to all of us. And we need you. How many of the body of Christ needs every one of us to be what we were created to be? Needs every one of us doing the service. It, it is something that has grieved my heart for years as I have seen what's going on in the body of Christ. There are gaping holes in churches. Gaping holes in ministries. Why? Why? Because people are not in their place. People have left their place. And people are not doing their jobs. And others are having to do their jobs and theirs too. Are you listening? It's sad. Because what if everybody was in their place? What if every child of God was fully hooked? Giving everything they're supposed to be giving, doing everything they're supposed to be doing, we'd be taking the world, my friend. We would be taking it exponentially faster than we are now. Well, it's not too late, is it? And we can't, you know, it's not for us to judge anybody else, but it is for us to see that we are doing our service. Now, I'm beginning to get into one of the biggest, most important parts of you finding and filling your place. Do you have a desire, first of all? Is it, so, is it in your heart? Do you want to find your place? Do you want to develop in your grace. Yes. Have a hunger for it. Have a desire. One of the big things is faith. And like, like always, and faithfulness. If you have faith in something, you value it. You esteem it. What did Paul say about his, his call, his ministry, his service? What did he say? I magnify, one translation says, I make much of it. Did he esteem it? Is he talking about his service? 
I know some years ago I've told you this before, but it'll bear repetition. I was in a, in a, in a service and, and I came back after having spoken and I came back through the speaker's room and I came by some people. There's a young man standing there. He's grinning from ear to ear. And uh, I said, hi. He said, hi. And they was quiet and somebody was talking to me and then they left and he looked over at me. He said, uh, Brother Keith, have you been to the bathrooms? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. Earlier I went in there. He said, how was it? I said, it was sparkling. It was great. He said, that's my job. I said, well, you're doing a fine job. He said, thank you, sir. I count it an honor. And the way he said it, and the way he, the, the twinkle in his eye, uh, he wasn't trying to put on some false air of humility. He really meant it. Amen. I said he really meant it. And it stuck with me. How many know it is true that it is better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness? Right? I want to I wanna read that. Put that up on the screen. It says, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Listen to the, the Jewish, complete Jewish Bible. Don't we have that, the CJB, complete Jewish Bible? It says, better a day in your courtyards than a thousand days elsewhere or anywhere else. Better, now this is what I thought was outstanding, better just standing at the door of my God's house than living in the tents, and this is talking about lavish places, just standing at the door of the Lord's house and the Lord's things is better than actually living in the lap of luxury of wickedness that has nothing to do with God. That's right. Do you believe that? Yes. There are no insignificant body parts. There are no insignificant places. There, when it comes to the things of God, I mean in the world, it might not mean anything. But how many know if you pick up a dustpan and do it as unto the Lord and it's something for his things, it matters. It matters. And the Lord will never forget it. Never forget it. The key is whether you esteem it or not. I said whether you esteem it or not. The question comes, can you lose your place? Can you forfeit your place? And that's a very sobering serious thought. But the answer from the scripture is yes. Yes. Let me mention to you two people, Judas and Esau. How many remember them? Judas. Go to Acts, the first chapter. Did Judas forfeit his place? Did he give it up? Did somebody make him do it? No. No, they didn't. I've heard people try to conjecture and say, well, you know, uh, somebody had to do it and, and it was in the divine plan of God. Listen to me. The Lord knew it was going to happen and, and it was revealed to him, but the Bible calls Judas a traitor and said it was better for him if he hadn't been born. Right? It says, woe that offense has come, but you know, it must needs be that offense has come, but woe unto that man through whom they come. Nobody made him do this. No, he wasn't doing something in conjunction with the request of the Lord. This is absolute betrayal and being a traitor. Isn't it? That's what the Bible said. In Acts 1 and verse 20, what does it say concerning him? It's written in the book of Psalms, and this was them talking about Judas. Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. The Amplified says, put up the Amplified on that. It says, let another take.
take his position or overseership. Today's English version says, uh, may someone else take his place of service. Somebody say place of service. Did he forfeit it? Why did he do that? He didn't value what he had. He didn't esteem where he was. You know what he valued more? 30 pieces of silver. Isn't it true? See, if you cease to value the opportunity God has given you to serve in his kingdom, you can forfeit it. You can disqualify yourself. Look in Matthew, Matthew 6, 24. You don't have to turn there. Just put it up on the screen. No, excuse me. I'm, I'm moving too fast. Matthew 26, 15 is what he, where he did this. Matthew 26, 15, he went to the, the leaders of the Jews and he said, what will you give me? What's on his mind? What will you give me and I will deliver him to you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. How awful. What was more important to him than the place? Did he have a special place? Yes. <sighs> special place? The Bible said the, uh, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb are written forever in the foundations of the heavenly city. I mean, we don't know what kind of place that is. But it should be a lesson for us that when the Lord allows you an opportunity to serve Him, you ought never look at it and despise it and act like it's nothing. Act like it's no big deal. Act like you can take it or you can leave it. Because if you do, you don't qualify. You're not worthy of it. Did you hear me? I know there's been times as we hired people to come on staff in the ministry, there have been times that people hesitated, you know, uh, uh, because of, you know, whatever reasons, if it was a move or if it was a, a money amount or if it was this or that. And there's been times I was tempted to try to make it easier for them or try to do this or that. And the Lord said, no, you don't. No, you don't. If they're not willing to sacrifice, if they're not willing to do some things to do this, they don't qualify. You know, we've, we've left everything repeatedly. And so you don't think about that, but there are many people that are not willing to. They just are not. If it's going to inconvenience them, if they're going to have to rearrange their life, they won't do it. And if you're that way, you don't qualify. I said, you don't qualify. When the Lord allows you something, allows you to do something, what should you do? Oh, you should magnify your opportunity. And your, no matter how small your place might seem, you ought to realize if it's in the Lord's things, it don't even compare with anything out in the world, right? Just to stand at the door of the Lord's house and things is greater than anything that's going on in the world, right? And oh, you should make much of it. Like that young man, you know, who asked me in the speaker's room, have you been to the bathroom? <laughs> he was making a big deal out of that. And, and, and will he get his reward? The Lord doesn't reward who's the most well known. He's not rewarding who's seen and known by more people. He's not, re he's not rewarding who's got their name on something. You know what he rewards? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. How many remember when the Lord talked about, he, he gave the story of the talents and how one man, you know, had, had, had a certain amount, another man had a less amount, another man had a smaller amount. How many know the man with the lesser, the second less amount got exactly the same uh, words from the Lord as the man that had so much more? Why? Because that's all he had. He was faithful to what he was given. But the man that hid it and buried it, he didn't esteem it, did he? Oh, he just buried that. He just throwed it under something. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12. 
Is this important to finding your place? See, one thing leads to another. I said one thing leads to another. You know why I'm standing here tonight in the ministry? Why, you know, we have the oversight of this church. I could look, I could look back to numerous things. One of them is I went to a meeting. Are you with me? I remember it distinctly. I went, the Lord dealt with me to go to a meeting. Didn't even know I was called to the ministry. Had to believe God. Didn't have the money. Didn't know how to do it. But we esteemed it as something important. And to make it happen. And we got there. And we did it. And while we were there, one thing led to another. And led to another. And he showed us this. And he revealed this to us. And in the months to come, that led to something else. And that led to something else. And we wound up in training. And then that led to something else. And then we volunteered to, you know, help arrange chairs and tote books. And that led to something else. And that led to something else. And that led to something else. And then we volunteered to talk to people after the service if they need to get saved or need to be prayed for. And that led to something else. And that led to teaching in the healing school. And that led to teaching in the Bible school. And that led to traveling with Brother Hagen. And that led to this and that led to that. And here we are. What if I'd said all those years ago, oh, it's just a meeting. That's a long ways to go. I don't have the money to get out there. I'm busy. I got to work. You and I wouldn't be looking at each other. See, people despise things as small and trivial and insignificant. It won't matter if I'm on that team or not. They got plenty of people to give. They got plenty of people that clean. They got plenty of people that work with the children. You need to do it more than we need you to do it. Are y'all listening now? If the Lord deals with you to do something, not only is it significant, but it's connected with the call of your life. Amen. It's connected to the ultimate place that you're called to. If you never take the first step, you'll never attain to the fullness. Amen. One thing leads to another. Such a serious thing to despise the opportunity that God's given you, the places that he's given you. Esau did this. Are you there in Hebrews? Esau did this. Chapter 12, verse 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man should what? Should what? Fail of the grace of God. How could you fail of the grace of God? Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Judas sold out being one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb for 30 pieces of silver. Didn't he? Did he magnify his place of service? Did he esteem it? Was he thankful for it? Did he glory that God let him have? No. No, it meant nothing to him. This is how you can lose your place. Esau. You remember the story. Verse 17. You know how that uh, for one morsel of meat he sold his birthright. You know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears. Time for us, friend, is very limited. If you're going to develop in the fullness of what God has called you to, some things just take time. And if you blow it off and you don't esteem it for 40 years, you, it can get to the place where you don't have enough time now to get to the fullness of it. Did you hear me? 
That's why the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, serve the Lord in your youth. Sir, teach your children, my friends. Teach your young people. Do not mess around and waste your life and change your major nine times and start over in five professions and do this and do that. Find out. Find out. How many know it would be better if you had to stay on your face for three months and find out? And how many understand God's not going to show you the whole plan for your life? He expects you to walk by faith. You know what he's going to do? He's going to give you a step. <laughs> and in the beginning, it's not going to look like a great big deal. It's going to be small. Why? Because if you're not faithful in the little thing, you, would, you don't qualify for anything bigger. You wouldn't be faithful in the big thing he said. So he'll deal with you. I know there was an individual I had prayed for some years ago. I prayed for this man over and over and over again. And you know, sometimes the Lord will tell you, he'll get straight with you about something. Because I kept pulling on him about this to do the certain things for this man. And finally the Lord got straight with me. You know, there are times when the Lord told prophets, don't pray for him. Didn't he? You know, he told Samuel about Saul, get up from there and quit mourning for him. Didn't he? I mean, he'll get straight with you sometimes. And on this thing he told me, he said, he said, hush and get up. I stood up. He said, I told that man to do two things. I told him to go to church. I told him to get a job and keep it. And until he does those two things, nothing else will follow. Hmm. So what do you say? See, people want to ignore what the Lord told them to do. It's not big enough to them. Oh, they can take it. They can leave it. They don't have to do it. Well, friend, it's not so. That's how you waste your life. That's how you forfeit your place. There are no insignificant places in the body of Christ. There are no insignificant jobs if it's for the church, if it's for the kingdom, if it's for the people. Do you believe this? Yes. Listen what Esau said. Genesis 25, you don't have to turn there, but this is what happened on the day that he sold his birthright. Genesis 25, 31. You know, Esau came in hungry, been hunting and didn't catch anything. He said he was starving. How do you think he'd actually starve and fall dead right there? You know, I doubt it. <laughs> and, you know, Jacob had, had on a big pot of stew and Esau said, give me some of that. He said, fine, sell me your birthright. Well, that's not nice either. <laughs> but you know, now, now get this. Who wound up with the blessing? His name meant tricker. Tricky. Right? He was a liar. He was shifty. But you know one good thing about him? He valued the anointing of God. Can you see it? Who, who winds up with the blessing? Who does the blessing follow? The guy that used to be the tricker. Not that God was confirming and condoning all that. But at least he did have this. He knew what was important. Right? He knew that if it was God's, it was big. It was important. And he wanted it. He said, well, let me have, let me have your, uh, your birthright. Esau said, look, I'm at a point to die. What profit shall this birthright do me? What good is that? See, birthright, among other things, was spiritual. And he's such a carnal, the Hebrew said profane individual. He sees no value in this spiritual stuff. Fine, great. I'm going to fall out and die here. Sure, you can have it. He said, well, swear to me. And he swore to him and sold his birthright for what? A bowl of stew. So should he have it? No, he should. Somebody doesn't appreciate it any more than that should not have it. Who qualifies for the things of God, my brother and my sister? 
It's not the person that's the smartest. It's not the person that can sing perfectly. It's not the person with the greatest education. There are people all around more talented than you and me. But you know who gets used of God? You know who? The ones that when they hear about an opportunity to serve God, when they see something, they light up. They go, ooh, that's great. That's important. That's valuable. Person after person that are friends of mine that are in ministry today and have been blessed so wonderfully. I'm thinking of people that walked away from inheritance. They were, their family was rich and it was all to go to them if they'd just do this and they didn't. They walked away. People that were offered these great positions and they didn't. They walked away. Why? Because just like Moses, they counted the blessings of God of greater value than all the riches of Egypt. Come on, can you see this? They said, this is what's important. And I am not giving up this for a bowl of soup or for 30 pieces of silver. Are y'all with me, friends? I'm not doing it. This is number one. This is important. This is what I'm going to give myself. This is what I'm going to separate myself to. I was in another state a few months back ministering. And I was waiting on the Lord and praying. And it came up in my heart. And I realized, you know, we hear these testimonies, uh, that even through our ministry, some people that had never heard some of these things in their lifetime. And I realized there's a lot of people on the planet have never heard one good message about faith or healing or prosperity, those kind of things. And I thought, I have heard thousands. Have you? How many of you heard much? There are people on the planet hadn't heard one. I don't know how many I've heard. At one point, working for Brother Hagin, it was my job to review all his messages. They were on tape. They were on these huge, back when they had those big cassette tapes. And they sent a machine to my house. And that was my job. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And, and I just begin to weep. I said, God, why me? I mean, I'm nobody. After the flesh, I mean, why me? And, and then as I was being thankful and thanking him, he spoke to my heart. I don't mean I heard an audible voice, but distinctly and said, he said, listen to this now. He said, I knew you would value it. I knew you would value it. I remember one of the first times I heard something on faith that was really anointed. Oh, man. I didn't, I didn't understand half of what they said, but it set off something in my spirit, and I thought, uh-huh. I like that. Well, what, what about it? I don't know, but I like it. <laughs> what does it mean? I don't really know, but I want some more. And I began to try to share it with my friends, and friend after friend acted like I was crazy. I see a lot of nodding going around all over the place. I, th I said, man, you've got to hear this. Did you know we have been redeemed from the curse of the law? Amen. They said, the curse of what? I said, listen, you've got to listen. So I asked them next week, hey, did you hear it? No, I hadn't got around to it yet. Huh? Man, this is life changing. You've got to hear this two weeks later, three weeks later. And they finally said, yeah, I listened to part of it. And you could tell it just made no impression on them at all. <clears throat> what does that mean? They saw no value in it. No value in it. I said, oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me a heart to value it. Giving me enough understanding to distinguish and see that it was precious and valuable. He said something that he said, I also knew you'd do something with it. And because of that, he gave me more. And he gave me more. And he gave me more. How many want more? Huh? How are you going to get more? Help me out. How are you going to get more? Go to Luke 16 in closing. How are you going to find your, your place? How are you going to develop in your graces? 
It begins with small things. It begins with little things. One thing leads to another. Leads to another. Luke 16, verse 10. 16, 10. He that is faithful in that which is what? Least. Least. Is faithful also in what? Much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? If the Lord lets you serve with somebody that's serving Him, should you value it? Should you esteem it? Should it be a big deal to you? Should you be willing to sacrifice to do it? Yes. yes. That's how you wind up with some things of your own. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and, uh, excuse me, hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and do what? Despise. Do what? Despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. See, that's what Judas tried to do. You can't. You'll pick one. And he did. And despised the other. The Pharisees that were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. And he said to them, you are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Is he talking about two very different value systems? Two very different priorities. What men think is so important. You'll see people leave good churches and good ministries and travel to places where there's not even a church for $5 more an hour. Happens all the time. You'll see people pull their children out, you know, places where they had opportunity to serve. To do what? Because they got a promotion. And they got a this and they got a that. Listen, God's our prosperity. God's our source. And when it requires you sacrificing your ability to serve the kingdom, that can't be God. That's right. I said it can't be God. Right. Can't be God. And there'll come some things where you have to make choices. And if you're smart, what will you do? You'll separate yourself unto it. And you'll value and you'll glory in it. And you'll magnify in it. And you, nothing will be too little or too small for you. You'll rejoice that you're able to do anything to bless the people of God. Stand on your feet, everybody.